Good morning, everybody. Welcome to our Thursday morning City Council study session for September 29th, my wife's 60th birthday, I might add. Happy birthday, Lori, yep. wherever you are. Yep. Happy birthday, Lori. Yep. Happy 60th birthday, Lori. Yeah. I was going to say happy 29th, Lori. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's good. So we're going to have two items today. We're going to hear from Dusty Fredrickson from Project Management Office on the Community Safety Initiative. And then we're gonna have some uh, budget discussions among council uh, as we come closer to uh, the formal presentation of the budget by the administration, which we thought we might have by now, but looks like it's coming in early November. So, Dusty Fredrickson, come on up. Council President, council, thank you for having me today. So I'm here to uh, give some information about the criminal justice initiative that kicked off in July and inter ask any, answer any questions that you guys might have as far as what its purpose is, how it's working, goals and objectives, that sort of thing. Uh, I believe we, we're here today because I have an SBO on the uh, agenda for this coming Monday for some funding to support that initiative. So. Um, I guess the best, best place to start would be at the beginning, um, where it came from. <clears throat> a couple of years ago, pre-COVID, we had a similar work group pulled together um, where we brought the division heads, department heads from the criminal justice, including fire, <clears throat> together, and we discussed um, topics that pertain to public safety and law enforcement, the whole realm uh, all those circles overlap, as we all know. Nothing operates independently. So it was a good opportunity for us to um, get those folks together, talk about cross-agency issues, which um, they often don't have an opportunity to slow down long enough in their operations to have those conversations. Um, so we reconstituted that, or the mayor did. It started in July. So the goal is to bring those folks together, talk about issues in the public that relate to public safety, community safety, and talk about it in the terms of our operations. Things that we are doing that we can do better and things that we might not be doing that we should be doing. Programming, different initiatives, things like that. Again, the intent was to focus on city operations um, and look for opportunities for improvement um, and also kick off new ideas. So, like I said, it's been, it is great, it's, it, it's a good platform. Council President, you attended last night. Um, Council Member Cathcart has been to two now, I believe, but these folks don't have an opportunity to get together and kind of discuss what their operational challenges are um, and problem solve. So that is the whole intent behind it. And it's, that's, that's kind of where we're at right now. So we have a few things that we're working through. Um, we're looking at how to reduce FTA rates, um, how to get some better tools in place for uh, dealing with or better handling of what we're calling mental health episodes. Um, that's a challenging one. We've done some continuous improvement inside of the prosecutor's office and uh, supervision for our interpreter process and budgeting. So it really is operationally focused. Um, so that's kind of the broad strokes. Uh, I'd like to see what questions you have. Council Member Kinnear. Dusty, thanks. You know, you've always done such great work and appreciate, appreciate you. Thank you. Um, so that, that's great. Um, my concern is that we might be working in a vacuum because without more closely um, working with the county or some of our other local jurisdictions, yeah. our problems aren't Spokane's problems, they're regional problems. Right. They're regional challenges. And so if we're not working closely with those other jurisdictions, we're making them Spokane's problems and Spokane's challenges. Correct. And I think everybody has to take responsibility for the region because we don't live in a bubble. We'd like to sometimes, but we don't. And so I guess my ask would be that as much as you need to coordinate internally with the city, there has to be some outreach and some understanding that right. we all bear a responsibility. Absolutely. Um, there have been several. We recognize that too, right? Um, there's been several challenges that we have faced and that have been brought to the table, particularly around um, custody 
um, and jail capacity. Um, we've been working with Mike Sparber to kind of better understand the challenges that he has to start generating ideas how the city might, this is really an idea generation group, it is, um, how we might be able to support him better. And inside of that, looking at what can we do in the municipal court and criminal justice arena to come up with alternatives to custody, like a, an improved and enhanced electronic monitoring system for our municipal court and supervision teams um, to, to take some pressure off the jail. Um, I understand there's a council president, you sent me a, a copy of a resolution that's on, that's in the works for a municipal criminal justice task force, which I believe is intended to be more regionally focused. Um, and I think the two can complement one another very well. Uh, we're just not geared and scoped to really take that leap across the river or elsewhere in other jurisdictions to start bringing people together. That's a whole different bag of kittens to, to manage. So this is where we'd started, um, knowing that we would find places where we needed to reach out across the river and, and work you know, regionally to solve some of our problems. So that, it's definitely a recognition of this team's. Um, and so I think, like I said, I think that if that one spins up, these two things, these two groups, if you will, can work very well together and complement one another. Thank you. Councilmember Stratton. Quick question. Um, yes, ma'am. So how does this group and the work that this group is doing, how does it feed into the discussions we're having on a municipal, um, a new building? We haven't really, we haven't brought that topic into the room. Okay. Um, because we know it's, it's, it's at a different level. We're really trying to keep it focused on how can we give the police officers better tools? How can we give Chief Schaefer's teams better tools when they go out and respond to a mental health situation? Um, how can we give the court better tools for um, uh, jail alternatives and getting people um, not routed to jail, but maybe to the treatment that they services. need, the services that they need. So that's where we're, we're kind of uh, trying to stay at that really okay. tactical level um, and solve, solve, we have a lot of <laughs> opportunity, I'll call it, uh, to get better at what we do because uh, some of the problems we have, we don't realize why they're happening. And this has been uh, really good to bring understanding to the table because the prosecutor could be doing something that SPD is scratching their head on. Why are they doing that way? So we're having some of those conversations as well. Um, and that's helped kind of enlighten and inform everybody and bring back to the table the fact that none of us are operating in a silo. I mean, our, our circles all overlap and run into each other. So we gotta keep that communication going because if, so if we're thinking about making a change over here, we know what the residual impact's gonna be over here or vice versa. So that's, that's uh, a lot of our focus. Okay, thanks. Yes. Councilmember Wilkerson. Thank you, Dusty. You're welcome. So in this think tank of uh, strategizing and tactical, I would always be asking the question, then what would be the next step when you come up with these great ideas? Yes. And who, owned, who would own that work for implementation? I'm glad you asked that. Um, so that is, if, we, if I just break down the process for you, we'll bring ideas to the, or problems, if you will, or opportunities or what we want to uh, discuss. In between those monthly meetings, uh, there is, their working group meetings have been occurring to focus on a particular challenge. And it could come down to one of three things. Um, it could come down to we have a current process in place, so we need to bring part of my team in and do continuous improvement and sort of figure out how to make that process work better, more efficiently. It could be that we figure out something that is a, an operational task. I'll use, just make an example up. Chief Schaefer, we need you to go back and do some training on this kind of a thing. The other thing is we will be spinning up projects, things that are bigger than an operational task and they're not quite continuous improvement, where we will put together a business case, cost benefit analysis, and then take it to the next step, which we'd be funding, and eventually turn that into a project so we can implement whatever that solution might be. So they, there's a couple different avenues, but we're, one of the lessons we learned from, <clears throat> excuse me, from the last time we did this was that we did not put enough 
project management horsepower around it <clears throat> because it's an expensive meeting. We have division heads, we have judges, we have council members. I mean, getting people into that room and investing the time into doing this, we want to make sure we also have enough capacity wrapped around it to make sure we're getting things to the point where they're actionable, uh, where we understand whether or not we want to do them. Um, so that's things that, <clears throat> excuse me. Okay, probably my voice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that, that's, I don't know if that, I hope that answered your questions, but we, we will, we would be, if we found it something that we wanted to do that was bigger than, you know, a certain amount of work, we would put a project manager on it and spin that up as his own charter it, cost benefit analysis, obviously find funding if it needed funding. Some of the stuff we, we can do doesn't necessarily need funding. It needs resources. And sometimes that's as hard as to find us funding at this point. Um, for us, so yes, ma'am. You mentioned funding, so yes. that's on everybody's mind. And you mentioned in SBO, what are you looking for in terms of funding? Yes, ma'am. Um, I mentioned that lesson learned from the last time we did this. One of the reasons why we didn't really get what we wanted out of it last time is because we didn't have a full-time project manager on it. I was trying to backstop it. Gloria was running it. Now Judge Brock, um, and it just sort of started and stopped every month inside of that meeting. Uh, we didn't have a lot of continuity from meeting to meeting to keep the momentum going. So the money for, that I'm asking for uh, for Monday's SBO is to fund the project manager that we have on it right now, who's from Volt. She's a senior level project manager, probably as much experience or more than I have, um, to keep the investment going and having those meetings and keeping the working sessions going from meeting to meeting. And it's all about coordination, facilitation, and follow-up <clears throat> at this point. If we don't have, I don't have the funding for, because my team has been, uh, is pretty short right now um, on, on resources, as well as we're implementing two fairly large projects this year. Uh, we're not done yet. We don't have any capacity. I'm afraid if we don't have the funding to keep Veronica on for the rest of the year until our capacity frees up, this initiative, it will, it will have to stop. It will not be able to move forward. And the number is? 100,000. Okay. And that's just from now till the end of the year? Actually from, I, I gotta pay back some capacity that I've already used on the contract, but that would be from, that would get us from July when it kicked off until the end of the year. Councilmember yes, Wilkerson. I'm, I'm the kind of the woe is me person. So really you're saying if we do not fund this position, we lose all the momentum, the knowledge uh, that's been created together yeah. to solve challenges that's yes. just simmering out there. Yes, yes ma'am. We would lose the momentum that we've had and the progress we've made up to this point and we would probably want to pick it up again at some point down the road. but. I'm fearful of that because um, we almost lost Chief Schaefer mm -hmm. during this process because he's like, Dusty, not again, right? He's mm -hmm. like, we've had these conversations, we've started and stopped them over the years, and he's, he's tired of having them, right? And I don't blame him mm -hmm. because we take him to a certain point and then we put him down to go to something else. And then we're just like, oh, we should get back to that a year later. And it's this start and stop momentum. Um, it's It's been tough on a few folks. Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, sorry, I, I came in a little bit late, so I missed <clears throat> part of this conversation. But I, I heard you say, it, I just want to make make sure I know what we're talking about. So, hundred thousand dollars for a po one position, or is this to contract with a firm? It's uh, Veronica, the um, project manager who's been facilitating since July. It's to keep her through the end of the year. Okay. And so, is it? I mean, effectively a. 200k a year sort of position it would then? be our hope would be that we would um after we get e-series put to bed which we kicked off on friday so we're still in the throes of that and we get uis utility information system implemented um we would have project management capacity first quarter of 2023 to transition it to a full-time employee and but, we but wouldn't at that pay scale 
two two hundred thousand dollars. Uh, whatever, uh, whatever. Hundred thousand for six months. So I'm assuming it's double that for the year. If we kept if we kept Veronica on and used her through Volt, it would be yes. Um, he's asking what would it be if it was an internal person per Yeah, it would be someone like me, a full time probably appointment, okay. um, senior project manager level because it's dealing with um, complicated subject matter, complicated. Um, some of our stakeholders are a little challenging. <laughs> um, a lot of lawyers. <laughs> a lot of lawyers. <laughs> so it would take someone okay. out of my office, probably 100%. Um, but that's not a $200,000 position. Right. No, okay. it's not. Okay. It is not. Um, the vendor resources, we, we rely on using them, and we try to use them in short increments because of the cost that comes with that, right? We don't have to pay their benefits. We don't have to pay their other, you know, the burden rate of having an employee on it, but they do come with a higher hourly salary. Um, but we use them as a stopgap, and we, we use them when we have to. Um, I'm short to continuous improvement analysts right now, and I have a senior project management vacancy, so I'm, I'm kind of caught in the, the, the line that everybody else is in with civil service to get those positions filled. And as soon as I can get my capacity back up, I can you know, I have left less of a reliance on using vendor resources. Yeah, I have a, a few thoughts. Um, just to clarify the resolution that I briefed at committee that we haven't voted on, but I, I did go through the administration. They seemed supportive through uh, city attorney at the time, Mike Ormsby, because he was in yes. charge of this um, after Gloria left. But as you mentioned, he had a lot of things going on, so not much was happening. And the administration was supportive of the concept that we had, which was to have some voices at the table that aren't there now, um, which are community voices. Um, we were on the Spokane Regional Law and Justice Council, and the city was in it, and to Councilmember Kinnear's point, uh, you know, for whatever challenges were there, we were all at the table, uh, various cities, various uh, departments, and then we also had the community lived experience voices and social service providers um, there, and that was really good, but the county made a decision about two years ago to get us off the health board and get us off that as well, and so we haven't had that. My resolution was not to do a regional thing because, you know, they, they, they clearly don't want to sit down with us at the moment. That could change after the elections and new commissioners, um, but um, it was to get that community lived experience. That's what we learned in the Regional Law and Justice Council is that it's all fine if the people inside the system talk about what could be more efficient and effective, but if you don't have the community voices, you don't really, you don't know that whole half side of it of what could be effective. And we have particularly people who had gone through as someone who's been charged with a crime and served time and who have come out the other end and gotten their master's degrees, and they're really savvy on the whole thing, and they're really effective. And so I would, I really wanna include those voices in this process, um, and, I'm, and you know, my plan is to bring that forward, but then my concern is, if we're having that meeting once a month with these people from the courts, police, fire, you know, they're gonna be like, oh, I don't wanna to go to two meetings. So I, there's that issue to talk yes. about longer term. I think it's, I mean, I think it's great that there is some consultation and Councilmember Kinnear and I attended the Gloria Ochoa led meetings, uh, now Judge Ochoa, um, and it was helpful. It was too bad that they didn't continue on in the new administration. So there is help for it. Um, I'm, I am torn on this because I really want it to go forward, even if it's not the full process that we'll eventually implement with community voices and lived experience. But I am challenged by the money. Uh, uh, the person leading it doesn't seem to have any subject matter expertise. And um, so that they're learning, we're paying them to learn this subject. And if they're only gonna be here a few months and then we're gonna have an internal person, uh, it, 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 I'm really torn by it, just so you know. I haven't figured out what I really think we should do on it. Um, I get you can't even fill the positions that you have, and so I want to give your department, and particularly you, some relief on that. Um, but 
it, it was challenging. And the other thing I would say, and I wasn't able to go to the first meeting, but I did go to the second meeting. I really see the opportunity for the project management would be within departments. Um, the big conversation piece takes some facilitation, but um, that subject matter expertise is really the people in, in, the, in, in the room. And I, right. I didn't see that coming to the fore as much. But I, you know, if prosecutors figure out, hey, we're going to implement this new diversion program, we want to be lean and mean and efficient, I really see that. But at the bigger, it's really more of a policy kind of issue. And so right. I, do, I wasn't that satisfied coming out of that meeting, but it was, you know, I know it was the second meeting and it was my first of it. But I, that is the challenge to me. It's a lot of money. And I'm, can, can we hire um, someone, a uh, project employee for the next two years with some subject matter expertise, uh, much like the county did with its SRLJC? Uh, that's the piece I'm just struggling with. I don't know what comments you have, and I, there's no perfect answer. But So, Dusty, we fund the contract person. So then this person that you're talking about, when your department's up to capacity, they are already in the budget. We will not be adding another position. No. It'll be one of the two vacant ones that you said you have vacant now. It would have to be. We, did, we have not asked for an additional, um, any additional uh, head count for 2023. Okay. Um, I just want to kind of uh, follow up with Council President Beggs. If, for example, the prosecutor example, they were going to do a, a diversion, uh, they're going to divert a theft charge or whatever that is, that would likely come to me to manage mm -hmm. at a 25% capacity for three months because I'm looped in with the legal case management team, um, the E-Series project. I've been working on that for five years. <laughs> um, those projects that sprout off, would probably more than likely come to me or someone on my team that has quarter capacity here, quarter capacity there. Those wouldn't be full-time commitments. To keep Veronica focused on getting that meeting from month to month and all the stuff that has to happen in between so we can identify what those projects are, we can get those moved over to somebody who can execute them. They're not gonna be able to implement a diversion charge without the help of the ITSD team, the, the folks that built the legal case management system that we implemented on, or we turned on on Monday. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of how that would work. And I do see, we're going to get to a point, right now we're climbing a hill, because there's all these things we haven't talked about in a while. Um, all these things that are kind of queued up. We will crest that hill when we've talked about what needs to be talked about, we figure out what initiatives we want to do in um, you know, going forward to address what the issues are. So I do see the tempo and the need for a full-time project manager sloping down once we crest that hill. It's just, it's new. We've had three meetings. Um, there's a lot of things that have been crammed in the in, onto the agenda that we're working through. But once we work through those, like I said, then, you know, it'll be a lot easier for me to staff that month-to-month -month meeting going into 2023 because it won't require, at that point, 100% full-time individual. Right now it does because it's in the, initiate, it's in the beginning. It, there's a lot to cover. Um, so I just wanted to add that. Can just add just a couple more things. One, though, I do want to say that the Municipal Justice Center, that to me seems exactly what this group should be doing. Not from a <clears throat> should we do one or not, but if we had that opportunity, where would be those economies of scale and efficiencies? We're, we're not officially in our feasibility period yet because the real estate people haven't had a meeting of the minds, but we might be in that. And I, right. it seems to me that would be great to say, all right, because the courts are saying, hey, this would be way efficient. It would help the prosecutors, public defenders, and probation. Right. Um, and so I, I just think we should do that. The second feedback is, and we, I could probably talk about it with the group, but we had some really good conversations yesterday, but they weren't really part of the agenda. They just, they were pressing issues, and that right. I thought was really helpful, and they were focused on the city. A lot of the things that came up that the report outs were, things about community education, volunteers, working with 
the county. They, they didn't seem to be that focus, internal right. operations. And I'm not sure what you can do from uh, your vantage. You got to sit in on the meeting as well, but to really get us focused. Because I think that tactical piece where people are a little bit lost getting focused would be of great help. Um, but I felt like we were talking about things that weren't really within the operations of uh, most of the people there. Yeah, that's, that, well, these topics started off in discussion with brainstorming sessions. So everything was on the table. Mm -hmm. And Veronica reported back those things that were discussed as mm -hmm. ideas to make sure anybody didn't get discounted on their ideas coming to the table. Um, we are trying to kind of take that, I guess, I know this term is that out of box you know, look at things. Are there things we can do that we haven't thought about? Leveraging education, um, community policing, whatever, you know, whatever the idea might be. Um, so I, I would say that's, that's pro probably what you're seeing is, is us working through separating the wheat from the chaff at this mm -hmm. point and, and making sure we didn't lose sight of what we brought to the table in those brainstorming sessions. Um, but, you know, pulling out what we can actually do, what can move the needle on these problems. So that's, it's part of the process. So it does to your, you know, <laughs> it probably does look a little clunky, um, but it will, it will clean itself up, especially when we start identifying things that we can actually sink our teeth into. Well, I really appreciate your coming on short notice and yes, engaging sir. with us and all that your office does. It's really an exciting part of the city. So thank appreciate you. Appreciate that, thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right, Mr. Boston, I don't know if you were going to, you're going to come up. Uh, I don't know if all of you have seen the email that he sent out that was really my email from the budget work group, but I was in another meeting or series of meetings. Uh, so there were just some issues that we wanted to talk about. And um, I think you added Councilmember Cathcart's addition to that, right? Yeah, yeah. I did. Um, um, and I, uh, Quite frankly, I don't have anything to present. Um, yeah. and, and really, it, this was meant more for a discussion between yourselves on the, on the memo that was sent yeah. out by Council President Beggs. I, I'm here to answer any questions if they arise, but um, it, it's really a conversation yeah. for the seven of you, well, six of you. And, and just to kick that off, so in the budget work group, um, what we, we were thinking we were getting a budget this, this week or maybe next so week at the latest? I talked to Jessica yeah. Stratton, and we should be getting um, estimated budget, budget uh, revenues and expenditures for, for 2023. Um, it's not going to be the detailed proposed budget like what we saw in, on November 1st last okay. year. I think it's anticipated to be the, the same November 1st deadline that okay. we're going to receive the full mayor's budget. So when are we going to get that? This I believe it's November 1st. Oh, no. the, the, the budgeted expenditures the, and revenues, that's, that should be happening on Monday. Okay. All yeah. right. So we are going to get something. So yeah. that's awesome. Um, well, when we met yesterday, uh, we didn't think we were going to get that. So, uh, and I don't think that changes it. it. It'll just give us more information. But what we talked about doing and wanted to hear from the rest of council is um, Sending a memo slash letter slash resolution potentially to the administration and saying, hey, these are the priorities we would like you to incorporate into your budget and some premises uh, when you give it to us on November 1st. And so this was the first list. Uh, it's just my attempt to uh, wordsmith what we all three council members discussed yesterday. Um, but we, I think we just kind of wanted to go through it and get head nods or changes from people. Uh, and we would convey, convey this probably in mid-October in time uh, for them to incorporate into their final budget. And it sounds like, though, we'll have a little feedback early next week, which will help inform this. And we'll see how much of it they might already have incorporated. Uh, they haven't seen it. And none of these things are new, so hopefully they did. But um, just to make them more specific. So I'll throw out the first one, and these are in no particular order, uh, but one, one was don't include any ARPA allocations that have not already been specifically approved by council in, the, in their budget. So don't put something in and say, hey, ARPA's gonna cover that. So that was one. Do we know if there, do we have an idea, are there, are there any of those out there that we don't, I mean? Well, about? they've been, 
the, the communications we've been doing is that yes, they have ones that they think ARPA should cover, either to finish okay. this year mm -hmm. or to go into 2023. Okay. And I would, say, I would just add, like, we've asked the mayor for, for what her priority list is for ARPA, and some of the things that are coming was not on her list, and so then, like, you're seeing as a mixed message. Mm -hmm. And so I agree that if it's not on, wasn't on her priority list, then why is it bubbling up now? Right, and I think that goes back to, and sorry for interrupting there, Councilmember Kinnear, but I think that goes back to, um, I think it's bullet point number five, is, which is bring all SBOs to close out the 2022 year um, no later than November 1st, but preferably by, by October 20th. And that's, that's including ARPA, that's including uh, you know, reserves, that's including any funds that is going to, any significant SBOs that are going to be needed that we already know about um, that are gonna need to be uh, done before the closeout of 2022. Councilmember Kinnear was first and then Councilmember Kepker. I, I don't think we should be so absolute on that first one. I, I don't wanna go nitpicky all the way down here, but if they have some ARPA um, request, I think we should hear what it is and evaluate it at that point, not uh, unilaterally say no, no well, before we and we're not saying sure. don't bring ARPA requests, but don't rely on your budget on ARPA. Yeah, don't put them into the operational to. budget. We, we, how could we, how do we know if we don't hear from them that they want to use it that way? No, so what we're saying is, no, make the request. Say we want to use ARPA for this, but don't include it in your balanced budget that ARPA has paid for it until council approves paying for it. I don't know. If so, so to, to, to explain it just really quick, and, and I apologize, mm -hmm. Councilmember Cathcart, but just really quick. So the, the way that the ARPA process is, um, or at least is meant to go, is that it has to flow through the ARPA committee process first. Right. So a request has to go to the ARPA committee process first, and then it has to be approved for an allocation to go into um, any sort of spending. Uh, what I, I believe Council President is saying is don't put it within your operational budget without any discussion prior to. Give us a, a request of what you're, what you're okay, thinking. I see. Then, then once the, the ARPA subcommittee has the opportunity to vet it and, and, and talk about it amongst themselves and then bring it to the rest of the Council for a study session discussion, then, it's, th then we talk about does it go into the operational budget for 2023 or do we have it as a one-off where it's, it's not in the operational budget? Because quite a few of the council members in the past have said they don't want ARPA funding in an operational budget because that, that very much identifies funding for an ongoing need Correct. within the operational budget, of which they're trying to avoid one-time dollars using for ongoing expenses. And which I totally agree with. Right, I was, right. It just sounded convoluted the way right. it was. Probably was. But Councilmember Cathcart, thanks yeah, for just your patience. To respond on that, and then one, one quick question for Matt. Um, I, I would like to see a balanced budget that, that doesn't rely on reserves or ARPA whatsoever. And then we can make the political decision of maybe we need to backfill some of the proposed cost reductions using ARPA. Um, probably not reserves, if, if you ask me, but, but maybe with ARPA. Um, and then that would just be a conversation that we would have at the council level of, you know, should we protect this program or this department or this whatever based on needs, et cetera, and is ARPA the right place to take that from? So I would like to have that, but I don't think we can quite have that conversation until we know what the alternative would be, which is what we're gonna reduce cost-wise first. Um, my other question, you, you said on the pause on SBOs or, or having the SBOs come forward early, you mentioned significant. How do you define significant? What's that threshold? Yeah, and, and w when that word came out of my mouth, I was I was kind of um, regretting it all already because I mean, really, any SBO at that point in time, when it's coming through, is already significant, right? Yeah. It, it's something that's not w that we've not identified within the operational budget that we're saying that is an emergent need that we have to fund. So really, all SBOs, um, by their definition, are significant and emergent. Um, I I really think. Um, as we're looking, I mean, we've had several d discussions over the past uh, several weeks 
um, as we're looking at, at what is going to impact the general fund, reserves, savings, cutting, whatever it may be, it's really those uh, collective bargaining agreements that are going to hit the hardest, as well as any sort of police and fire overtime that we see at the end. Uh, you know, just, just as a reminder, council was hit really hard with a, um, a uh, fire overtime SBO at the tail end of last year while we had while we were also dealing with budget expenditures at that point in time. So we were looking at the 2022 budget and then we were dealing with an emergency fire SBO that we had to scramble to try to come up with some solution there. Thankfully, we didn't use the 3.6 million that, that um, was originally proposed to council of ARPA dollars. We were able to um, find some other funding opportunities within the, um, the uh, yeah, the Public Safety Personnel Fund and, and pull the money out of there. Uh, but but that's, that's what we're really trying to avoid is once we receive the, the mayor's proposed, proposed budget on November 1st, we should really be focusing on that and not issues that are going to be trickling in because realistically, I think administration, council, um, and, and staff within, within each department know what is what is needed to get through to the end of the year. We're looking at three months really from tomorrow. Um, and, and we know what is needed. We know we can look at the 75% of the year that we've had so far and, and make a pretty good guesstimation of what we need to get through 1231, 2022. I'm just gonna affirm that. I'm thinking we're in the fourth quarter. All these last minute surprises should, uh, I mean, there might be some, but at this point, point in our budget year based on what they already know financially SBOs should not be as prevalent as they are right now going into the end of the year yeah. and being dependent on ARPA funds to fill that so um, that's that's just my challenge it's like well we're not you're not looking ahead or not planning if you're being surprised um, with hundred thousand dollars here or five hundred thousand dollars here that doesn't right. make sense to right. me from a financial position at this time of the year. Yeah, and and I and I can't say that some of them aren't going to happen. I mean, there mm -hmm. are there are needs that are emergent needs that say for example, you know, they they expected to have an employee, a department expected to have an employee within within their department to get a project done by the end of the year and wasn't able to hire that employee and there therefore needs some sort of contractual services uh, uh, SBO change so that they can pay for that. That that's going to happen. But but what we're trying to avoid, I think, is the piecemeal effect that we're getting, where we're getting SBO for this, SBO for that, SBO for this, and and we don't have a full picture of what we're going to end at in 2022, and that that carries on to 2023 as we're looking and we're trying to make forward proje projections. So we we want to get a holistic picture of how the general fund and all of the departments are going to be impacted by all of these SBOs that are coming forward so that we can really focus on 2023 and rebuilding those reserves and, and making sure that the, the city's financial health is stable for years to come. Because we know that, that you know, the, the, the economy health may, may not be in, the, in its perfect form over the next couple of years. So we have to be focused on long-term projections, not just 2022, not just 2023. We need to be looking at that six-year projection. So I, I, I think that's the reason why we're trying to do that, so that you know we can get all of that news and have all of that information as we are preparing. And the last thing is, there are several weeks to do it. So it's not like, oh, you can't break. It's like, no, now is the time. And again, to Matt's point is when we start debating and fine-tuning the 2023 budget, we want to know how much money we'll have coming out of 2022. So that's the thing. It's a, it's a tool. It's not going to be, you know, somebody cuts off your finger or something like that, you know, because, you know, there might be a thing that's revenue neutral. Technically, it's an SBO, but it's revenue neutral. So, but we just want to get it as much as we can, very different than last year. Um, going back to the next point um, was... <clears throat> asking to include in the budget at least a 10% reduction in general fund expenses for 2023, specifically identified. We had talked about 15%, but we thought that might be too challenging of work, but to see the potential cuts. Now, there's a choice, as Councilmember Cathcart says, there's a political choice. 
Well, if you have less money, you're going to get less things done, and it's how important. But what we're asking is for the people closest to the problem on the operation side to say, well, if we were going to do a 10%, this is the 10% we would do, so that we at least have the benefit of their knowledge and their expertise when we make the policy decision of whether to keep that or not keep that. And I just want to touch on that really quick. I mean, I think we, we talk a lot about um, deficit and what the deficit number is for 2023. And there's a lot of different conversations of, you know, the deficit's this, the deficit's that. We, we, we generally go into a planning year with some sort of deficit. There's some sort of, it's a, it's a moving target and we're, and we're moving things around and that is what you do in city government. Uh, that is what you do really in all government um, finance. It's, it's looking at not only, okay, how do we attack the deficit so that we're not, we're not dipping into fund reserves like Councilmember Cathcart was saying, but also with what we're talking about doing in 2022 and why we want those SBOs, all SBOs for 2022 to happen right away is even if we have a balanced budget and it's exactly the same as, as the current year that we're in, we need to also be looking at and this goes to, to Councilmember Cathcart's uh, point number 10 here, is replenishing our reserves that we are hitting in from 2020 to current. I mean, we're looking at a 80% drop in reserves if all of the collective bargaining agreement costs that are current come out of that, uh, that, that unassigned reserve. That's a significant hit. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, we talk about uh, general fund best practices. The general fund best practice is to have a plan of how you're going to replenish that within three years. An 80% hit is pretty tough to, to replenish within three years, especially if you're looking at an uncertain uh, economic climate. So, so that is something that we need to talk about. So even if we're not, even if the budget is completely balanced, we need to make sure that we are bringing money back into that reserve so that some of our financial ratings don't get impacted negatively for a long period of time. Yes. So there's another piece to this, and that is we have to consider as a council, if we're making cuts or if we're saying, I, mean, I agree the 10% is probably a good compromise. What we decide can't um, impact or negatively affect or cost us more going forward. So in other words, if we decide, just, just an example, if we decide we're going to cut um, maintenance on, I'm just using this, I'm not saying we're going to do it. Let's say we're going to cut maintenance on our arterial streets, mm -hmm. let's just say. Well, in the long run, that is going to cost us more. Mm -hmm. So we have to be cognizant of that short term, we may be saving money, but long term, they cost the city more money. So I, I just want to keep that in the back of our heads. Same thing with when we start cutting employees or if, or if we're cutting positions. That's institutional knowledge that's mm -hmm. walking right mm -hmm. out the door. Yeah. And that is what's costing us right now because right. so many people have left who have taken all that knowledge with them. And so some of our departments are deficit of that institutional knowledge. I would just just to agree, I mean, I think that that's really important, and I think that's why we want to make sure that we're getting as thoughtful of kind of ideas brought to us by those departments and the department heads and the administration who are closest to that work being done to make sure that, you know, there's a scalpel that's making these choices and not just a big, you know, axe or sledgehammer. Right. And because that's what, I mean, if it's up to us to make cuts, that's what will end up happening is we'll make big sweeping cuts that, that aren't necessarily thoughtful because we don't have that on the ground in the weeds information. Absolutely, and, and I, I think that is something, I mean, that is, that is really important to think about. I mean, we can, we can um, you know, take things away. I mean, the, the, the classic example that I, that I have right now is that the, the, the fire department doesn't have any apparatus in the capital improvement plan for next year, but we know that that's been an ask by the fire department uh, through the administration and the administration has asked for it, but, but invariably I think they're, they're pulling that out because they need to balance the budget. But what, what does not funding it in 2023, what impact does that have 
in future years. We know that it balances the budget in 2023. We know that we can pull that lever out of 2023, but there is going to be a trickle down effect that's gonna happen in future years. And we don't know what that is. So that's, that's why we're looking at this one to six year plan on a regular basis. It's, oh yeah, we can, we can pull this service out or we can pull this purchase out. And yeah, that, that helps us balance the 2023 budget. But I think these lists of priorities are to not only balance the 2023 bu budget and get us through 2022, but to make sure that the financial health of the organization maintains through 23, through 26, 27, 28, 29, 30. Yes. To, to your point, going to number three, include any requested fire and police capital uh, that is to be expected in 2023. We don't actually have a good grasp of what they have right now, how old it is, what it's used for, where it's assigned, and not to mention how much is needed. So I would ask that for both police and fire, they drill down so we actually have a really good snapshot of what they have uh, just everything I've yeah. said, because I have no idea what they need and what is absolutely, and best practices. What is, what is needed for a community our size? Yeah. Or is this Cadillac version or is this right. the Volkswagen version? And, and I would, I mean, I would say to public safety departments, defense, you know, they, they really have been engaged in those conversations and fleet has been engaged in those conversations. And I think that they, uh, fully believe that they are giving that information to say, hey, here's what we have and here's what we need. And, and they are presenting that on, a, I mean, just over the past year and a half, they've presented that several times to council. And I mean, it's, it, we've had a, many discussions about it, whether it be electric or whether it be um, the purchases that need to happen right now. I, I, I know that, I, I, but I agree with you on what you're saying, but I think we need to phrase exactly what we need mm -hmm. and exactly what we're expecting in that conversation. Yes. Um, and that is, I mean, when we're talking about, when, when you're asking the question of, is our, do we have the Cadillac of fleet for our, our our organization, or do we have the Chevrolet, or do we have you know the Ford Pinto option? We don't know, but that is something that's going to come from an external uh, study that 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 we have to conduct because that's something that I I think fleet would have a hard time to give us, but we can get the information up to that point to say okay, this is what we have. This is what's needed. This is what it's costing us in the current, you know, in the current amount that we have right now. Um, th those conversations have been had, but we need to clearly define what we expect of them and what our next steps are right after that. I, I don't disagree. They have been, but then when I started digging, I found out some things that were quite shocking. So I want to make sure that we're digging even deeper. Into Absolutely. This. Absolutely. Well, and I just want to throw in what happened. The other challenge is it has not been tied to an actual financing plan. We had a financing plan for many years and we were increasing year over year a million dollars general mm -hmm. fund new right. that could uh, buy more capital and eventually become self-sufficient. The administration abandoned that in 2021, but they have not replaced it yet. Mm -hmm. And so that's one of the asks in here is like, yeah. okay, I, I get it. We, you abandoned it, but we need a new one because that's the question for me of like, okay, it keeps coming on a piecemeal basis. I'm like, what is the plan? Are we gonna start doing SIP loans again? How are we gonna pay those off? We asked for the, we asked what, we told them what we wanted. Yeah. So yeah. it was just disregarded. Yeah, yeah I, I think, and, th and that's, that's part of that, having that not just, the, and that goes to Council President's uh, point, number four here, provide a longer term for fire and police capital expenditures. Because right now, you know, that, that should be integrated as part of the operational financing plan is, is for those departments. They, they need to be integrated in the operational financing plan. Right now we had, um, we've had, you know, we've had, thankfully we've had ARPA behind us, but you know, what, what happened in, in 2022, in the 2022 budget is we said, okay, no purchase or no, no funding to be happening within the, uh, the 2022 budget for ARPA. Well, as you probably remember, we got the 2022 budget and on January 3rd, we were presented with an SBO for ARPA for fire trucks. Um, and, and likewise for police cars, it, just a, sh a few short months after that. So while it wasn't in the operational budget, we were piecemealing it in after the fact. Yeah. 
for operational needs. So that's something that we're trying to avoid of saying, okay, let, let's look at this long-term plan. Let's see what we're gonna have because ARPA money realistically is gonna be gone. I mean, I, I would say it's gonna probably be 90% 90, 90 spent by the end of next year. Yeah. And if it's it's already, the majority of is already allocated as it is right now. And I just wanna, you know, grab Councilmember Wilkerson, but yeah, that's one of our points is, make a commitment not to give us SBOs in January and February, just so you can balance the budget on paper with smoke and mirrors and then say, oh, just kidding. It's not balanced, you gotta do this. So, that, but I'm interrupting you. I just want council to know that the budget committee had asked the administration this back in July. We had asked to meet with their cabinet members to ask them to drill down what they needed, what they really needed, what they could do without. We did not have access to cabinet members about what their direct needs were. So we're not like bringing the hammer down in the bottom of the ninth. We've been asking these things since the middle of the year. And so now here we are. So just council members know that we're not trying to play the heavy here. We've been asking for engagement and it has not happened to the level that we had asked for. Council Member Stratton. I just want to comment this is pretty basic, but I, I would just really like to know when I look at the budget, be before we look at the budget, can you give us something that says what do you absolutely have to have this year? What is mandatory emergency? What do you have to have? And then what is, is something that is not an emergency? Is, right. is icing on the cake. Yeah, and right. just lay it out like that. So we, I mean, that's how I do my budget for the year well, is what can I afford this year and I'm gonna have to, <clears throat> is that an well, emergency or is this a priority or am I gonna move it here? And, and we had it asked make that, it easier. Mm -hmm. j j just like Council Member Wilker saying, saying, we had asked that back in uh, June, July um, to, for kind of an unfiltered access to the cabinet members, for them to come up to tell us what your budget requests are for to, to get you through 2023. What do you absolutely right. need? Um, and and I think the response that we got, and, and I, I understand it, is that, you know, they wanted to have their discussions with the mayor first, and then, and then they would decide on how they were going to talk to um, council. And, and that's that's not quite the unfiltered look that council was looking for because right. that was what they were looking for was not what the mayor has approved, but what council is willing to approve. Um, it's a difficult situation because at the end of the day, the, the, the mayor is the CEO of this organization. So, I mean, if we were to make parallels between the um, t a private organization, so th those, those requests should really be flowing through them. But at the same time, I mean, I understand that council wants to understand and have a better right. finger on the pulse to say, we need to know what, what these uh, departments want. We need, to, we need to not see it just from the lens of the, the CEO of the organization. We need these organizations themselves or these departments themselves to give us that sort of information. So it's kind of a push and pull. Um, I, I don't think um, any way is perfect. I see both sides of the equation on that. It, it's difficult um, when you, you, know, you, you have a, a, a person that it should be making those decisions to, you know, in, an, in a roundabout way, go around and ask the council for what their priorities are. At the end of the day, though, the council does, it, it is the council's budget. They, uh, they have the ability to authorize the budget, the spending. If a, if a priority goes through one side and doesn't go through another side, it, it's the council's prerogative to do so. So it's just, it's, it's tough. That, that component of it is pretty tough. Um, I think many of us want to be done, uh, but I'm just going to do two, uh, two things. Uh, one, uh, the last one, number 10, is a commitment to you know not just get through 2023, but preserve our reserves and increase them and have a plan for going down. I mean, there's, it's an election cycle at the end of next year, so some people might be tempted to like, well, I just need to get through this year an election, uh, but no, we're looking forward on behalf of the city for going forward whether we're here or not. So we need to have that commitment, and then ARPA, just a little more on ARPA. Uh, uh, two pieces. One, we talked about finishing up ARPA allocations by this year so that the, no longer is that just sitting out there and everybody with a good idea can say, oh, we could do it this way. And that money, the 13 million or so that remaining, as Matt's fond of saying, has been spent tw two or three times over. And we just are like, let's just finish that. But that's why we want to get all the information for the end of 2022. 
We want to get the true things that are needed in 2023. And then the last piece was um, the administration has requested that all the balance of ARPA go to revenue replacement. And we discussed this concept of saying, well, we will approve some revenue replacement uh, to the degree that you tie it to permanent cuts in the budget. So you show us the position that's leaving, uh, the, ideally a vacant position that's leaving, that will be permanently, so the ARPA becomes one time as opposed to not, of just getting us through. So those are concepts and um, question. The, the only other thing, and I'll take your question, the only other thing is we talked about a tool. Um, we had a lot of vacant positions, as you know, and what happens in the budget traditionally, if we just leave them vacant, that takes money out of the budget. That's a $100,000 hit to the budget that we don't have to spend on something important. Even if it's not filled, mm -hmm. it's there. And so we could do something called a contra um, account, which says, yeah, we're not going to get rid of that position permanently from the city. But for 2023, it's contra, which means it's actually going to be a revenue for the city instead of an expense with a tag that says, but you can't fill it during that time. So it keeps, so the department knows they'll get that position back eventually, and it might take them a year to recruit it anyway. But it is a true savings as opposed to what's been going on this year, which is we've said, oh, we're gonna save things with salary savings. But as you've seen from all the SBOs lately, everyone's like, oh yeah, well, this is budget neutral. I did my salary savings and I wanna buy this truck or I wanna do this, paint this room, and the salary savings go away. Uh, and so this would be a way to tighten that up a little bit. So two things. Yeah. We did that a while ago. And so what happened? We asked for that, I think it was two years ago. Yeah. There, there, is a, there is a reserve some. for payroll savings within right. the budget. Every six months we were going to look at the budget and say, okay, these weren't filled. Oh, but, you were, that ordinance didn't get passed. That was a sweep ordinance that yeah, was going to yeah, sweep yeah. the money. And it didn't get actually enacted. I think it we did should get look. passed, but it didn't get enacted. We'll let's look. Yeah, let's it look. didn't get the way we've imagined it did not happen. Correct. So, so I want to find out why. Okay. But the other thing is, um, you've got a request out there for the administration to do a number of these things. What's your what's your hammer if it doesn't get done? It's not my hammer. It's your hammer. What is our I hammer? Mean, uh, no, Just no. say no to a Nancy. Well, right I mean, it, no. down to what a handful of the council members have been alluding to. I mean, then we then then the council looks at cuts and it, it is not done as strategic as it should be. OK, that's because, what I want to know. I mean, yeah. as council member Cathcart says, let's use a scalpel to to surgically remove the things that can be removed and we can still be a living organism versus coming at it as a blindfolded chainsaw and, and, and just buzzing things off. And the reason I ask this is we've made requests before to council member Wilkerson's point wanting to meet with the department heads, the, um, the cabinet members and fell on deaf ears. I wanna make sure that our request is not only heard but is actually enacted upon and that we have something left where we can say, okay, if you don't want to do this, then we are going to do this. So I just want us all to be thinking about what is that? Well, is, it, th is it the chainsaw? Yeah. yeah. But this is, this is what we heard last year. We went through this process, you remember, and we got their things, we heard their presentations, and we each gave individual feedback, and we, did, mm -hmm. we gave them exactly, and then the budget included almost none of it. And the, what we heard back was, well, you guys didn't vote on yeah. it. Uh, in a formal session, so we didn't know that that's really council's thing. So we're just trying to fix that communication piece. So this is a first conversation, which they can watch this, but we do want to do a document before their budget comes to us All right. that says these are the things, so there will be absolutely crystal clear. And then, yes, if right. they disregard it, we write the final budget, just like we did last year. We made our amendments to conform to what um, we thought was best for the city's long-term financial health. But we do want to just make sure there's no doubt about what council is asking. And so we want to put it in a document that at least four, hopefully seven of us will sign. So. With that, we'll excuse you to lunch. And uh, we'll see everyone on Monday for council day. And uh, have a great weekend. Mm -hmm. Take care of yourself. And if you can, someone else. We're adjourned. Hey.